Um, hello, everyone. And today I'm going to do my presentation on Bell's Palsy. Um, Sadaqat Ruziva. So, what's a Bell's Palsy? Uh, Bell's Palsy is named after Charles uh, Bell, uh, who was a Scottish surgeon, uh, anatomist. And uh, he described the condition in detail in the early uh, 19th century. Uh, Bell's palsy is a sudden temporary uh, paralysis of weakness of the muscle uh, on the one side of the face. It's most common cause of facial paralysis and the condition occurs when the facial nerve uh, which controls the muscles of the uh, facial expression becomes inflamed, swollen and compressed. And uh, this nerve damage leads to distortion of or loss of facial movement on the affected side. And uh, here is uh, some statistics on Bell's palsy. Um, incidence rate, uh, Bell's palsy affects approximately 15 uh, 30 people per 100,000 uh, per year. It's estimated that about uh, 40,000 people in the US uh, develop, uh, develop Bell Bell's palsy each year. And age, uh, it can occur at any age, but it's most common um, between the age of 15 and 60. Gender, uh, Bell's palsy affects men and women equally. Recurrence, although uh, rare, but uh, Bell's palsy can recur in about 8-10% uh, of cases. Um, then recovery, about 75% uh, uh, of people with Bell's palsy uh, recover completely without treatment and typically within three uh, to six months. Uh, uh, and approximately 15, 30% may have some residual symptoms like weakness, uh, twitching, or any other, uh, other issues even after recovery. So here is the anatomy of uh, facial nerve. The seventh cranial nerve, the facial nerve, emerges from the brainstem and then enters the temporal bone where it travels through a narrow Z-shaped canal called the facial canal. The facial nerve exits the skull through a tiny hole called the stylomastoid foramen. From there, the facial nerve branches off to different facial muscles that help with facial expression, like the ones you use while whistling to your favorite song. Ultimately, control of each side of the face comes from a region of the brain called the motor cortex. As an example, let's start with the lower half of the right side of the face. An upper motor neuron extends down from the left motor cortex, goes across the midline in the brainstem to the right side, and then meets with a right lower motor neuron, which hitches a ride on the right facial nerve. For the upper half of the right side of the face, things start similarly. There's another upper motor neuron that extends down from another region of the left motor cortex, also goes across the midline in the brainstem to the right side, and meets with another left lower motor neuron, which also hitches a ride on the left facial nerve. The one huge difference is that there's another upper motor neuron that extends down from a region in the right motor cortex, and stays on the ipsilateral or same side to meet with the same lower motor neuron. In other words, there are two upper motor neurons, one from each side of the brain, giving input to one lower motor neuron. The left half of the face is similarly innervated, so that means that each facial nerve contains motor information for the lower face coming from the contralateral motor cortex, and motor information for the upper face coming from both motor cortices. The facial nerve also innervates the sublingual and submandibular glands, which secretes saliva, as well as the lacrimal gland, which produces tears, and mucous membranes of the nose, mouth, and nasopharynx. In the ear, it innervates the stapedius muscle, which dampens the vibration of the stapes, a small bone that helps transmit vibrations from the eardrum. And this protects you from loud noises. The facial nerve also carries sensory information about taste from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. So if you lick an ice cream cone, that's the facial nerve registering the flavor. And uh, causes of Bell's palsy. Um, 
the exact cause of Bell's palsy is unknown, but it's often associated with uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, toxins, Lyme disease, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, sarcoidosis, infections like hypersimplex, Epstein-Barr, uh, varicella zoster viruses, and autoimmune theory. Uh, new evidence supports that idea uh, that Bell's palsy may involve autoimmune um, me mechanism. And there is some research exploring how immune system uh, dysregulation may contribute to the condition, which uh, could lead to a new treatment approach uh, targeting immune responses. And uh, here is the risk factors for Bell's palsy. They are pregnancy, preeclampsia, obesity, hypertension, uh, having had Bell's palsy before. Symptoms of Bell's palsy, um, onset of the disease, typically uh, sudden, with symptoms developing within 48 hours. Uh, we can see here inability to wrinkle brow, drooping eyelid, um, inability uh, to close eye, uh, and asymmetrical smile, drooping corner of mouth. So diagnostic approach uh, for Bell's palsy, uh, of course, first is patient history, um, sudden onset of unilateral uh, facial weakness or paralysis, absence of trauma or systemic illnesses, um, presence of pain around the jaw or behind the ear on the affected side, and possible changes in test sensation as anterior to source of the tongue, and history of recent viral infections uh, like upper respiratory tract infections and absence of other uh, neurological symptoms like weakness in arms and legs and no altered uh, consciousness. And second one is physical examination. Um, uh, First is facial muscle weakness. We can check for asymmetry when the patient smiles, raises eyebrow, closes eyes, puffs out cheeks. And next is forehead involvement, uh, inability to wrinkle the forehead on the affected side. Um, suggests that uh, lower motor neuron lesion is characteristic uh, finding of uh, sign of Bell's palsy. And next, eyelid closure, incomplete closure of the eyelid on the affected side, uh, known as lag of tongues. And then drooping of the mouth, difficulty keeping fluids in the mouth or drooping on the affected side. Next is taste test, uh, decreased taste sensation uh, on the anterior to sort of the tongue. And hyperacusis, increased sensitivity to sound on the affected side due to involvement of the spidious muscle. Then tearing, um, reduced tearing or excessive tearing on the affected sides. And in this video, we can see classic symptoms of Bell's palsy. So let us examine the facial nerve in this case, camera. Let us examine the facial nerve. First, we will inspect. On inspection, the findings are, you can see the angle of mouth is deviated towards the right side. If you see closely, the nasolabial furrow on the right side is prominent, but on the left side, the face appears to be sagging and the obliteration of the nasolabial furrow has occurred. Ak bankariye, you can see there is inability to close eyes. Fir se aak kholiye, aak bankariye, and the eyeball is rotating up with attempted closure of eye that is Bell's phenomena is positive. Mere haath ko dekhte hoi, upar dekhte ro, you can see absence of wrinkles on frame on the left side has occurred. Khawa bhar ye dono pao, isme, the air is escaping from this side and it is flabby and the air is escaping from this side that is from the left side. That is the vaccinator muscle we have tested. Who is still marne ki kosis kariye? Again, the air is leaking. There is absence of real contraction of the muscle. Orbicularis oris we have tested. Here there was absence of wrinkling. That is the frontal belly of occipital frontalis was not work. Aap chor se aap band karna, me kholne ki kosis karunga, mere ko karne mat dena. You can see easily this eye can be opened. As compared to this, this is orbicularis oculi muscle. Tight karna gardan ke 
paint karo you can see here this part is contracting well and there are inability to contract this side so at the end of the examination what we have seen in this is a probably a case of a left sided intranuclear facial palsy or bell's palsy and how spread my scale um, this scale is a nerve grading system developed and um, 1985 uh, by Los Angeles otolaryngologist uh, Dr. House and Dr. Brackman. Um, it used to characterize the severity of the facial uh, paralysis patient symptoms. Uh, we can see here six grade. And um, if we see the asymmetry on, uh, on patient's face uh, at rest, it means uh, uh, it already fifth grade of disease. And diagnostic tests we use EMG helps uh, helps assess the extent of nerve damage or and predict recovery. And next is nerve conduction studies uh, to evaluate the function of the facial nerve. And then we can do MRI CAT scan. Imaging may be considered to rule out other causes of facial paralysis such as tumor, stroke, multiple sclerosis, and especially if. Um, Atypical features are present like gradual onset, bilateral involvement associated, uh, associated with uh, other neurological uh, symptoms. Then we can do blood tests for the Lyme disease. If the patient is from a region where Lyme disease um, is endemic or there is suspicion based on history and uh, uh, herpes simplex virus or varicella zoster virus serology. Uh, it's not typically necessary uh, for diagnosis, but may be considered if there are typical features. So differential diagnosis, it's crucial step for uh, to diagnose. Uh, diagnosing. Um, it's first is uh, stroke. Uh, we can see certain uh, onset of facial weakness, but often sparing on the forehead. Mm, then ramsay Hunt syndrome associated with painful vesicular rush in the ear or mouth. And then Lyme disease, history of tick bite, rush, erythema migraines, and joint pain, fever. And then tumors uh, characterized by gradual onset of symptoms, associated weight loss and other uh, systemic signs. Then multiple sclerosis, uh, presence of other neurological symptoms like weakness in limbs, uh, visual change. Then of course, again, Barry. <laughs> Bar syndrome may cause bilateral, uh, bilateral uh, facial palsy, typically with uh, other neurological findings. And treatment of Bell's palsy um, uh, aims to speed up recovery and reduce the risk of complications. Uh, management involves uh, of combination of medication, uh, supportive care, and sometimes physical therapy. Here is a, a structured uh, approach to treating Bell's palsy. Uh, first one is medications. We use corticosteroids. Uh, usually we use prednisone. It's first line treatment. And uh, prednisone is uh, commonly prescribed because it can reduce inflammation and swelling of the facial nerve, uh, which may help improve recovery and uh, improve recovery rates. Uh, typical dose prednisone is uh, 50, 60 milligram per day uh, for five, seven days, and f uh, followed by tapering of the dose over the next week. And timing is very crucial. Uh, best started within 72 hours of symptoms onset uh, to maximize effectiveness of this medication. Next is antiviral medications. Uh, the role antivirals like acyclovir, well, acyclovir is debated, but uh, they may be used uh, in conjunction with corticosteroids in cases of severe Bell's palsy or uh, if uh, there is a suspicion of uh, herpes simplex virus involvement. And next is analgesics. Uh, we use over-the-counter pain uh, relievers like acetaminophen or ibuprofen. It can uh, be used to manage pain or discomfort associated with Bell's palsy. Then uh, next step is eye care. 
uh, we use artificial tears for patients who cannot uh, fully close their eyelids. Um, using artificial tears during the day helps uh, prevent dryness and corneal damage. And uh, eye ointment and eye patch or tapes uh, we use at night usually uh, to keep eyes lubricated and protect the cornea. Next step is physical therapy and facial, facial exercises. And facial exercises can help maintain muscle tone and improve muscle strength. Uh, we can refer uh, to uh, physical therapists uh, in, to facial rehabilitation. They can provide uh, guided exercises and message to stimulate um, the facial muscles and nerve recovery. And we also uh, can recommend the uh, techniques, uh, uh, including smiling, raising the eyebrow, uh, eyebrows, and gentle messaging of the facial muscles. Um, and other option is surgical intervention, as there are two types of surgery, uh, the compression surgery and cosmetic surgery. And the compression surgery is rarely recommended due to uh, due to risks. It's generally reserved for cases where there is evidence of significant of compression and or when there is no improvement with medical therapy. And cosmetic surgery uh, for patients with long-term facial weakness or symmetry, uh, cosmetic procedures may be considered after recovery to, recovery to improve appearance. Then we can use electrical stimulation. This therapy is used to stimulate muscles uh, to contraction, uh, muscle contraction, and can be part of rehabilitation therapy. But evidence supporting its effectiveness is limited. Then we can use um, uh, bot Botox injections in case of uh, synchronizes, uh, involuntary movement. Um, accompanying a voluntary one, or long-term residual facial asymmetry. Uh, Botox injections may help relax muscles and improve facial, uh, facial asymmetry. And uh, we can use alternative therapies like acupuncture. Um, it might be considered for symptom, uh, symptom relief and to promote relaxation. Uh, although more research is needed to confirm uh, their effectiveness. Uh, of course, uh, we should follow uh, to uh, regular follow-up appointments to monitor progress and recovery and uh, assess for uh, uh, of uh, facial function improve, improvement over the over time, typically within a week, weeks, two months. And uh, patient education and support, uh, educate the patient about the typical course of Bell's palsy, uh, which often includes continuous recovery, and provide reassurance about the likelihood uh, of improvement of the benign nature of the condition. And we can uh, refer patients to supportive groups uh, or counseling. Uh, um, it may be beneficial for patients coping with the emotional and psychological impact of facial paralysis. Uh, most people with Bell's palsy recover fully within three uh, to six months, and uh, particular with timely intervention. And here is the uh, references which I used for presentation. And that's all. Okay. Thank you so much for your attention.